Okay, my name is Julia Contreras Arcia, and I will be talking about uh, chemical bond today. Uh, my talk will develop as follows. First of all, I will um, talk a little bit on how and why we study chemical bonds. We study them through the topological approach. So I will be introducing uh, main concepts about topology, uh, critical points, topological partitions, and how we can apply them to chemistry. So uh, through uh, three chemical functions that I will be uh, introducing today, electron density, the electrolocalization function that Miriam already introduced, and the non-covalent interaction index. And after introducing this whole methodological approach, uh, I will uh, show you one uh, application to solid state, which is very neat, that Miriam already started. So why studying chemical bonds? I really like uh, the sentence by uh, Roald Hoffman on that, uh, which reads like, many solid chemists have isolated themselves from their organic or even inorganic colleagues by choosing not to see bonds in their materials. One is unlikely to understand new materials with novel properties if one is wearing purely chemical or physical blinkers. We should aim at a coupled approach, a chemical understanding of bonding merged with a deep physical description. So what, we'll be, uh, what I will be talking about today is this chemical understanding of bonding that it's needed to understand properties in materials, especially of new materials. And that's because if uh, we carry out a normal calculation, then what we have is our conventional approach is we have this structure, we calculate the properties. But if we have one property we want to optimize, uh, we really need to understand how these two are related, so structure and properties, and that's going to be through the chemical bond to actually be able to do inverse design. So how studying chemical bonds are many approaches, but the one uh, I always work with is the topological approach. Basically, um, bonds are objects of classical chemistry. They're qualitative, they were introduced before the advent of quantum mechanics. Um, and this provides a very neat uh, categorization of our system, but um, it's only qualitative. If we want to go quantitative, we have to go to quantum chemistry, but that gives us a delocalized description of the system. We will have uh, the solution of the Schrodinger equation for our whole system, but there is no uh, operator for bonds in the Hamiltonian. So um, we're missing all that classical information that is actually so interesting, so important to understanding how our system is constructed. So in order to connect those two worlds, uh, the uh, topological approach is very useful. Basically, we, uh, ba it's based on the fact that bonds were conceived in real space. So our system, uh, after, resol after solving the Schrodinger equation, it's going to be anyway defined in 3D, and we can use this 3D information to retrieve all this information on atoms, bonds, uh, even uh, more chemical concepts such as electronegativity and so on. So um, this provides us with a mathematical definition of atoms in a molecule, of bonds, etc. It also enables uh, comparison with experiment. Um, now we have uh, enough X-ray uh, resolution to actually be able to use the densities that are derived from experiments to actually even carry out those topological analysis from experimental densities. That also enables us to actually check how good we did on our calculations with respect to the experiments where we have the information. So how does it work? Um, I will show you. Uh, uh, since this is a school, I, I'll, I'll go to the basics. Uh, I'll start by introducing what uh, do we mean by topology, uh, by uh, doing a simil, uh, a simil with uh, topography. So uh, that's the very, very basics. So <laughs> go back to uh, El Instituto, to high school. You're analyzing a 1D function. You want to understand how the derivatives behave, how the second derivatives behave, to understand where the maxima, the minima, the saddle points are. That's how you understand a function in 1D. Now we're working with a 3D function, so everything becomes, uh, okay, we had a saddle point there. So everything becomes a little bit more complex to see, but um, basically we're in 3D, so there are four types of critical points. Now, before, in 1D, it's maxima, minima, subtle points. In 3D, we have maxima, 
we have minima, and then we have two types of saddle points. We can have a maximum in two directions and a minimum in one, or a minimum in two directions and a maximum in one. So that's uh, the difference between saddle point of order one, that's a maximum in two directions and minimum in one, and the other way around, that's a saddle point of order two, where uh, you can imagine kind of a um, um, horse, uh, saddle horse function where you have a minimum in two directions. Topography. It's uh, very intuitive when we, see, um, when we see something in orography to actually, our mind directly does this topological analysis. We see here an island, we see the isosurfaces, the isolines uh, of um, the height, and we, clear, we very fast in, uh, identify there actually three points here that identify the highest points in our island. That's looking at our maxima in the function. We can also look at the valleys. That's what our mind will also do, kind of looking for the zero gradient path, so the minimum uh, path that we would follow if we wanted to, um, if, if uh, water was falling down here or down here. So that's the information we're going to use. That's uh, how we will understand our island and that's what we will use in 3D. Here we are in 2D. So that's using critical points. There is also another thing about this type of topological analysis, which is um, topological partitions, which our mind also does intuitively. Uh, okay, here you have the saddle point and the zero gradient path. We have our island. Very intuitively, we'll say, okay, we have three regions. We will just follow this zero gradient path over here that goes through the saddle points. And then we have three regions. These three regions have some very interesting properties. They're not overlapping. Uh, there are many partitions in chemistry where you actually have overlapping regions. In this case, they're not overlapping. Uh, and that will turn, out, very interesting, uh, turn uh, out to be very interesting when analyzing properties. Uh, I will show you how. Um, they fill up the whole volume. That means that if we add up all these three regions, we end up with the whole island. And now what we have to do is we use this type of description to actually understand the chemistry in our system. For that, we need a chemical function and we will analyze its critical points and its regions just as we did with the island. Since it is a chemical function, before we had an island, uh, it, the information was about height, so we ended up with topography, uh, topographical information. If we now have chemical, a chemical function, we will end up with chemical information in our partition. So, we need to define chemical functions, and depending on the information we put into that chemical function, we will end up with different partitions, obviously. Uh, the chemical functions we will be analyzing today, it's the electron density, the electron localization function, and the non-covalent interaction index. The electron density is a fundamental property of any system. Um, it condenses all the information through the Hohenberg and Kahn theorem. You just have to uh, integrate uh, the weight function, uh, all the coordinates, uh, all the electronic coordinates but one and the spin, and you end up with the electronic density. It uh, behaves something like uh, we have cusps uh, associated to every maximum, so that's the way it looks like, for example, for lithium uh, hydride. Oh. No, sorry, but I'm not done yet. <laughs> so, um, the electron localization function. The electron localization function was introduced by Bikin et Scom in the 90s, and it can be interpreted as an excess of local kinetic energy density due to Pauli repulse. The way it works is basically we have here the kinetic energy density, so basically that's the kinetic energy as at each point in space, that's the kinetic energy density associated to bosons. So if we take, if we get rid of this contribution, we will have something that is giving us the kinetic energy density uh, due to the fermionic nature of electrons. And that's what uh, is actually giving the Pauli, um, the Pauli behavior. Now, this is a kinetic energy density, and it uh, depends on the density, like uh, dens the density to the five-thirds, so we have to get rid of this density dependence, otherwise we would not be able to compare core and valence regions. And then, um, just for it to be more easy to interpret, it is mapped 
so that it, that it goes from zero to one. When we uh, do this, the picture we obtain is the following. We recover the Lewis picture of a system. Um, here we have uh, chlorine, and you can see that when we uh, picture elf isosurfaces, we obtain three isosurfaces for the three atomic cells in uh, chlorine. We can also obtain bonds. Here you have ethane, and you see carbon-carbon bond in green. You have the carbon core, and you have the carbon-hydrogen bonds, which are always very big here in white. We can also differentiate different, different types of bonds. Here you have uh, the molecule I just showed you, uh, ethylene with the double bond, and then acetylene, uh, which looks like that due to the uh, infinite uh, symmetry. And then finally, in our Lewis picture of a system, we also need to understand where lone pairs are. That's very important in solid state. Um, so here we have an example with the water molecule. Here we have the oxygen core, two lone pairs, and the oxygen hydrogen bonds. Um, when we use this type of partitions, it works very nicely for covalent bonds, but not so nicely for weak bonds. Here you have um, the uh, benzene picture, uh, the uh, picture for benzene dimer, and as you can see here, we have the critical points of the density, which are uh, telling us there there are carbon carbon bonds. But actually, that's uh, not very well described in the interaction here because that's a pi stacking. That's a benzene to benzene interaction. So for that, so for those cases, we use another function, which is the reduced density gradient. The reduced, uh, that's uh, done through a method which is called NCI, and uh, it is used for the visualization of uh, non-covalent interactions. It works as follows. Here we have, um, Let's imagine an atom or a molecule, and the density will fall off as we get uh, out of the atom or the molecule. It can be shown that the reduced density gradient behaves like rho to the minus one third uh, as the density goes to zero. Uh, so as the density goes to zero, the reduced density gradient goes to infinity. In other words, if we plot the reduced density gradient in terms of the density, as the density goes to zero, this explodes and goes to infinity. Instead, that was the example of formic acid dimer. Now, if we have uh, an uncovalent interaction region, like in formic, uh, that was the monomer, if we have the dimer, now at some point we will have a, a density um, saddle point here, which makes it exploit, or exploit uh, and then the reduced density gradient, if, instead of going to infinity, it goes to zero. In other words, we have the behavior we had before, and on top of it, we have these peaks appearing which are related to the non-covalent interactions in the system. So it's very easy to identify when we have non-covalent interactions uh, through this method. Uh, what we do then is we choose an ISO value for the reduced density gradient, and then we plot it, and that's the kind of picture we get. We get isosurfaces which are related to the non-covalent interactions in the system. Here we have the oxygen-hydrogen bonds the hydrogen bond, sorry, oxygen uh, with the oxygen, and we have um, dispersive interactions here. I'll show you later how we can identify them. Um, it works for many, basically for all uh, non-covalent interactions from attractive, like we had here, formic acid dimer, water dimer, but it also works for delocalized interactions, like benzene dimer I showed you before. Now the picture we have, instead of having these critical points, is a surface that connects these two benzenes and uh, clearly identifies the stacking interaction between these two molecules, similar for methane dimer. And here you have another type of uh, interaction, which is repulsive. The repulsion is very important when determining the stability of a compound. And here you can uh, clearly see two textbook examples with uh, cyclooctane, uh, with uh, bicyclooctane here with the repulsion inside the uh, bicycle, and these surfaces in between the branches in uh, branched octane. Of course, these interactions go from attractive to repulsive, so we need to identify which kind of interaction we have in its case. And for that, we also, uh, up to now, I mean, everything I showed you, we know from chemistry, but we want to do it from first principles, and for that, we also use the density. 
in the first place, uh, we use the density itself, because uh, the stronger the interaction is, the stronger the density will be in the non-covalent interaction region. Uh, here we have one example where we have um, the three types of, in, of interactions. We have a phenol dimer with a hydrogen bond, with the van der Waals interaction in between the rings, and with the steric propulsion inside the rings. Three types of interactions, three peaks. We have three, two peaks at higher density and one peak at very low density. Of course, the one related to van der Waals will be the one at low density, but we still have these two peaks which overlap, which are the steric clash and the hydrogen bond. One is repulsive and the other one is attractive. So we really want to differentiate those uh, one from each other. And for that, what we use is the uh, density derivatives. Basically, when, you, uh, when we analyze derivatives, uh, obviously in the uh, main directions, so the, eigen, uh, the eigenvalues, uh, we can see that if, you, uh, if we're expecting a bonding interaction, there will be an, a charge accumulation. If, uh, if there is repulsion, there will be a charge depletion. And that um, is reflected in the second eigenvalue. So what we do is instead of just plotting the reduced density gradient in terms of density, we plot the density times the sign of the second eigenvalue. And now you see this plot deploys into two. So now we have one of us always in the middle, and now we have uh, so, um, repulsive interactions are um, minimum, so they have posi uh, positive eigenvalues, they go to the right, and uh, repulsive uh, and attractive interactions, they have uh, negative second eigenvalues, so they will go to the left. We use this same quantity to color the isosurfaces I showed you before. So that's the kind of uh, picture we get. We go, uh, we have a three color code. We usually go for blue, green, and red. We use uh, blue for strongly attract attractive, like hydrogen bonds, green for very weakly attractive, uh, like Van der Waals, and red for strongly repulsive, like in brand octane. And those are the pictures I showed you before. We clearly can tell the interaction that is happening in each case. We can also apply it to the systems which are more complicated, where the different interaction types were mixed together. So now you can easily see the two hydrogen bonds, which are very strong, stronger than the one in water dimer. Uh, Van der Waals, the stacking, indensing, the steric repulsion inside the rings, and now we have here the hydrogen bond in between the alcohols, Van der Waals, and the repulsion inside the rings. So as a summary for this part, uh, we have complementary functions to describe what is happening in our system. If we want to understand um, what, uh, where the atoms are, where uh, the bonds are, especially covalent bonds, we can just use the density. If we want to see where those covalent bonds are, but we also want to see lone pairs, then we go for the electron localization function. And then if we have non-covalent interactions, we have to go for NCI. Obviously, you can do uh, a mixture of all these methods in the same picture and understand how everything is working out in your system. So, now, uh, that's for the picture, but we want to understand what's, uh, we want to go quantitative. So we uh, first analyze the critical points. If you do that with the electron density, of course, the, um, their casps with can be associated to maxima in the electron density associated to each atom. So here we have benzene, and you get a maximum for every carbon and for every hydrogen. If you actually do an isosurface uh, across the plane, that's the picture you get. So you can clearly identify carbon positions, hydrogen positions, and then if you, uh, this theory, which was introduced by Bader, what he said is, okay, now let's say that if there is a first order saddle point, so you have a minimum in one direction and a maximum in the plane across it, now it's going, that's going to be our, uh, the, the definition of a chemical bond from the electron density. And so if we follow this line and we have a first order cell point here, then we can say we have a carbon-carbon bond. If it doesn't happen, then we don't have a bond. That's what happens here, for example. If we go from hydrogen to hydrogen, there is no saddle point there. There is no hydrogen-hydrogen bond. That's obviously very easy right now because we all know the structure of benzene, but that was not so easy uh, when it was first discovered. So uh, basically, that's what 
you get carbon-carbon bonds, carbon-hydrogen bonds, and our definition of a bond associated to saddle points. So critical points of the electron density can tell us where we have a, a chemical bond. We can use that. Uh, here I have located the critical points. So you have here the uh, carbons, hydrogens, the bonds as uh, derived from the electron density. And here you have a second order saddle point. And that enables us to actually draw the chemical structure of, uh, of a molecule or a solid or um, uh, any compound. Elf, that's the critical, those are the critical points of uh, the electron localization function in basic systems, like the ones I showed you with the isosurfaces. You can easily see uh, where you expect the carbons, the carbon-carbon bond. Uh, for uh, You expect to maxima when you have a, a double bond. Do you remember the ring? That's a degenerated critical point. Same in benzene, and very important, because now we introduce a new concept. Here we have the water molecule, and we have the lone pairs for the oxygen. So we can tell where these lone pairs are, and if we have a weird chemical structure, we can tell whether there is or there isn't a lone pair. More important, if we now go into the partition into regions, we can also analyze the properties of these um, of these chemical entities that's um, based on the properties I told you before. These regions are non-overlapping and they fill up the whole volume. That means that if we integrate any density, and by density I don't mean electron density, I mean any operator which is uh, 3D defined, we can determine, we can obtain um, region, uh, region properties. So. Uh, if we integrate the electron density itself, then we can, uh, we can obtain charges associated to every region of a space, which is topologically defined. These charges, once added up, will give us the total number of electrons in the system. That's really what uh, chemists were doing when associating charges uh, from the beginning. Since these regions are non-overlapping and they fill up the whole volume, as I was saying, they're additive and they will recover the whole crystal value. One example, here we have uh, the molecule in lithium hydride. If we go across the plane, we go for, this topological, for the topological partition according to the um, electron density, then we will have charge since we have maxima in these cases, in this case are associated to atoms. So we, have, we will have atomic charges. So we will have a chemical meaning. This will be our lithium molecule. We can, our lithium atom, we can really define the atom inside the molecule. We can define the hydride inside the molecule, and we can integrate the properties and, uh, for example, associate uh, the charges associated to it and see that it is really a hydride. If we go for the electron localization function, and now we uh, local, remember we can localize the critical points uh, in the system, we can also integrate them. So we can know the charges associated to lone pairs, the charges associated to bonds. That's really going back to valence cell electron pair repulsion theory. Here we have ethanol. We have uh, obviously the carbon hydrogen bonds, carbon oxygen, oxygen hydrogen, and the lone pairs in oxygen. We look at the electron localization function, and you can really tell where the carbon oxygen is where the carbon hydrogens are, and you can uh, also see the uh, oxygen hydrogen bond and the lone pairs around it. You can integrate them, and you can obtain the charges associated to them, which are pretty much close to what is expected from. Oh, okay. So you can have the charges associated to these bonds and these lone pairs, which are very much pretty close to what one would expect, but not necessarily. You can uh, see how this bond is depleted, uh, which one would expect from electron additivity. But now you have a number. And uh, you can tell the, the population from the, for the lone pairs around here. You can also integrate volumes. Up. OK. You can also integrate volumes. And when you integrate volumes in Lewis structures, you really go back to valence cell electron pair repulsion theory. And you can check, indeed, how the core volumes are very small, smaller than bond volumes, and 
how the biggest volumes are usually occupied by the lone pairs, which actually explains how uh, the geometry is constructed in 3D for these molecules. So it can be really be used to understand up to understand how the system is working. So we have now three functions which depend on uh, 3D information, which give us complementary information, and which we can use to actually understand what's going on in our system. And that's what we did with Medium. Um, for one neat example, I will show you, and then it can turn off, because I'm done. Um, so that was uh, metals under high pressure. It was um, uh, obtained some years ago that uh, sodium would go into a transparent and insulating phase at around 200 GPA, so a five-fold compression. And uh, we really wanted to understand the electronic structure behind this new state of matter. What's happening to a metal that actually is insulating? And for that, we looked at the electron localization function, and with, uh, with the input I've given you now, you can clearly see how at the beginning, when we have a metallic phase, we have here the cations, and we have this flat surface around it, which represents the um, sea of electrons. It starts localizing as we increase the pressure, and then when we go to the insulating phase, that's the neat structure we obtain. We have cations here, and that thing localized here, those are electrons. They're as localized as the cations. So basically, electrons from the valence, they have left out, completely left out the core. They have created new pseudo cores, which are, behave like anions in our system, but with no core inside. So that's why we call them uh, pseudo anions. And of course, if we have cations and anions, that's kind of a pseudo ionic structure, and it's not going to conduct. So we can go from actually the calculation and understand in 3D why this pro new property is happening from very easy, from, uh, in a very uh, visual way. More interesting, uh, same thing for potassium. In this case, um, when we analyze the, uh, the high pressure structure, here we have the cations, then pseudo anions, um, you can, we can actually found that the, uh, these pseudo anions were localized in the same week of positions as uh, real anions in A2X and AX2 compounds from potassium. So basically, these um, pseudo anions are, are um, taking the same place as real anions in our structure and are given rise to the same properties as any ionic structure in uh, potassium. So I, I, with that, I am done. Um, just uh, two sentences. Uh, nowadays, the quantum chemistry of solids can be considered as the original field of solid state theory that uses the methods of molecular quantum chemistry and molecular models to describe properties uh, of solid materials. We uh, are really interested in actually understanding these properties if we want to understand our system. Just doing the calculation and obtaining the energy uh, is not going to give us much insight of what's going on in our structure. And really high pressure, it's a wonderful playground for that. Because uh, as you saw with metals, when uh, we change pressure in our sample, new electronic structures can appear that can maybe cannot be described through classical models um, and which uh, and then we will not be able to understand those properties if we don't have a, a mathematical tool to understand them and um, okay that's it I let you free possibility to obtain high resolution uh, um, diffraction from sample at high pressure in diamond annual cell or such analysis just remains a matter of calculations only? Yeah, yeah, the people have done it from uh, density studies. Yeah? Let me ask you one question. You, 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 you have shown that with the, the L function you can to uh, the ionic and the metal state, and how about superconductivity? <laughs> 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 They're very funny. 
Okay, superconductivity is a two electron property, so it's not that easy. But um, some time ago we had a look at that, on that. There were some papers insinuating that some of uh, superconductor structures were actually associated to um, a weird lone pair behavior. So there are some papers where they're actually able to see this weird lone pair behavior where you have lone pairs which are actually uh, clearly delocalized between them and that were associated to the superconductivity, but it's not something established. Yep. Um, you might have said this, but what is the, so what is the threshold for the spheres of the electron localized stability function? Where, because they, they're clearly not completely yep. space fitting. Uh, so what is the thing that determines where you stop integration? It's, yeah. Oh, you stop integrating. Uh, following, uh, so since you follow zero gradient paths, that's where your region stops. And then, yeah. So when you plot isosurfaces, it's, it's not filling up the volume because it's an isosurface. But when you do the parti topological partition, it does fill up because it follows like in the island, you just follow the zero gradient path and that will fill up the volume. No, because those were isosurfaces. So it's, it, okay. Mm, okay, so if you draw an isosurface which belongs to this value, you will find a sphere. But if you do the topological partition, then you will have something going through here and there, and it will be filling. But these points will not necessarily have all the, say, all the same L value. So it's... Yep. They fall inside those isosurfaces. No, inside, when you integrate, you want to be, um, to have an objective uh, partition. So you always do topological partitions. Okay, so that's in Bayesian. Yeah, that's a Bayesian number. Yep. So you were talking about the signature of the Laplacian. So mm -hmm. it depends on the scene, is that flexion or a construction mm -hmm. of the charge? Okay. So, but in some cases, some hydrogen bonds have positive signature or negative. So, how do you classify this interaction? So, those are for the Laplacian of the electron density, but we're not using the Laplacian. Okay. Because oh, we're yeah, using the, the yeah, no, because we're using the, uh, the uh, eigenvalues. And in those cases, so the Laplacian is the sum of the three eigenvalues. Yeah. And the problem with a hydrogen bond is that uh, it might, one might dominate over the other. But when you only look at the second eigenvalue, it will always be negative. Because it means that you have okay, okay. your things approaching, you have a minimum along this, okay. So just the second. Yeah. That's why we chose the second eigenvalue, because uh, the Laplacian for weak interactions is not informative enough.